Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Tonight I'm reporting on some very strange events. Bigfoot roaming the wilds with a child. Human hybrid or kidnapped child. In May 19 of 2000, uh, a story made its way into the Canadian newspapers and it says, In Vancouver, Canada, excited researchers are combing the wilds of British Columbia in response to a recent sighting of a Bigfoot accompanied by a blonde-haired boy. More than two dozen people claim to have seen the human youngster dressed in animal skins and loping alongside the towering beast of a man. Investigators speculate that the mystery boy may be a missing survivor of a plane crash that occurred in the area 11 years ago and he is possibly raised from childhood by a Bigfoot or a family of Bigfoot type creatures. This is the most tantalising development in Bigfoot research to take place in decades, said Dr. Rob Worrier, a zoologist involved in the hunt for the elusive forest creature. He went on to say, It suggests that Bigfoot is not some shambling monster, as he is often depicted, but a gentle and intelligent being capable of nurturing behaviour and compassion. Dentist Dr. Arthur Goston who was camping in the Rockies with his family, first spotted the boy, described by the eyewitnesses as lean and wiry with long matted hair. The Vancouver man was awakened in the early morning by the frantic cries of his 12-year-old daughter. When he emerged from his tent, he saw her pointing into the woods. She said that a wild boy was stealing our food, Dr. Goston recalls. I looked where she was pointing and I saw the half-naked boy slinking off into the trees with an armful of canned goods. Shouting after the child, Dr. Goston gave chase and he caught up with him at the edge of the clearing. I couldn't believe my eyes, he said. The boy was standing next to an enormous hairy man-like creature that was at least eight feet tall, Dr. Goston said. This thing took some of the boy's food, then they ambled off together into the woods and both of them walking with the same hunched over ape-like stride. Now since that sighting, at least 33 people have reported seeing the wild boy and his hairy companion. Witnesses have included clergymen, forest rangers, and even members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. In many cases, the mismatched duo have been heard exchanging guttural sounds as if talking to each other. Now, the youngster has all the earmarks of a feral child, said the newspaper. A child that has no human contact and has been raised by an animal, said the Seattle-based Dr. Warrior. The fact that his gait is similar to the Bigfoot and that they can communicate is evidence that the creature is his surrogate parent. Now, researchers believe that the wild boy sightings may be connected to the 1989 crash of a private plane carrying a party of French tourists visiting the region. The crash left the pilot and four passengers dead, including a young mother, Madeleine Dessoir. Madeleine's baby, Marcel, was missing and the remains of the one-year-old infant were never found. And the source of that story is Ken Christian. So there's a very plausible story of a young man left as a small child who was raised by uh, the Bigfoot he was seen with in a kind of happy accident scenario. Or do we have a situation often reported where a Bigfoot impregnates a human woman or a human male fathers the child of a Bigfoot female? Both of which seem bizarre, but there are documented cases of this very thing. The very famous one is Zana, for instance, the Alma from Russia who gave birth to eight children, all fathered by her master or some of the village males. Only four of her offspring survived after being washed in the icy waters of the nearby river. And the surviving four were raised by Zana's older wife. As Zana had the baby, she took them away so that Zana couldn't wash them in the water. She still has great-grandchildren alive today. And her genes run in many Russian families. Now, known for her strength and hatred of men, when she was first caught and kept in a cage outside, she dug a hole like that of her hair and slept in it. She was poked with sticks through the bars. And some nights she would be forced to drink the local brew. And anyone in the owner's favour could take her for the evening and do as he pleased. Zana never left 
even though she eventually was allowed to wander at will. She would go off into the woods for months on end, but she always returned to her children. One villager did state that she was wonderful around children, and it was only males she was violent against. Her son fit was prized for his strength. One quote states, even when losing his arm in a fight, he was at work the next day and he continued to work as if nothing had happened. He was known for his terrible temper and great strength. And in a younger day, Zana was said to be able to outrun a horse with ease. Now, there's a very strange legend in the legend in Magolia of the son of the Alma. And it's an old tale that goes back and it says, a man traveling through the mountains on a regular basis had a peculiar encounter with a female Alma. The pair would meet from time to time as he passed by and she began to catch his eye. Eventually, the pair had a son. The boy proved to be so intelligent that he was accepted to study at a prestigious monastery where he went on to become a noted scholar. And we've all heard the story of Seraphine Long and her encounter with the family of Bigfoot. She was mated by the son of the Bigfoot after being taken from a tribe and he eventually took her back home. And unfortunately, depending on which story you read, the baby did not survive. In her book in the 1950s, oh no, sorry, in her book, 50 Years with Bigfoot, Janice Carter tells how she and her sister, Lilla, were raised by their grandfather on the family farm, the Carter farm. Now, the grandfather helped to save a baby Bigfoot who grew up around Janice and her family. And at the age of 15, she was attacked by a male Bigfoot who wanted her for his bride. So badly was she attacked, her leg was broken in the scuffle. Now, the Bigfoot that the grandfather saved, Fox, was said to have raised his own family close to the Carter farm and that he remained there until he passed with his human and Bigfoot family around him um, a couple of years ago now. Johnny said that they, they, he would come to the farm and he would ask for things like garlic and clothes, something that, with a very strong flavour to it. Um, and she went on to describe how they would take down deer and they would run at the deer from behind. They would put one hand on the deer's neck one hand under the, de the deer's belly and the neck will be pulled back until it was broken. Or in her case, when they wanted to disable something, they would push it to the ground and twist the leg until it broke. She was able to fight him off. But um, if you want to read the book, or you, um, I have included actually a link to the case files um, in the description below. And it's Bigfoot case files and it's 50 years with Bigfoot. Um, and it's a um, very good read. It's uh, something very interesting. So, do we have a situation here with the fair child mentioned, who was maybe taken from a camp or whilst hiking with his family? We all know of the Dennis Lloyd Martin case. Dennis was born in June uh, of 1962, and he was an American child who disappeared on June the 14th of 1969 in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee at the age of six, and he was just a couple of days off his birthday. Now, the search effort was the most extensive in the park's history, involving approximately 1,400 searchers, and they searched a 56 square mile area. Now, Dennis Martin, as I said, was a six-year-old resident of Knoxville, and he was visiting the Great Smoky Mountains National Park along with his father, his grandfather, and his older brother on the Father's Day weekend in 69. Now, the camping trip was a family tradition for the Martins, and the family hiked from Cades Cove to Russell Field and camped overnight. The next day, they hiked to Spence Field near the Appalachian Trail, where they planned to spend the night. Now, little Martin disappeared on June 14th at half past four while playing hide and seek with his brother, and other children from a separate family that they came across by accident. A strange coincidence being that that family were also called um, oh, the Martin family, which is uh, kind of strange. He was last seen by his father going behind a bush to hide, intending on surprising the other children when they walked past. After not seeing him for about five minutes, the father went out to check on Martin, but he couldn't see him. And he presumed Martin had joined the older children to play the game. When all the other children returned to the campsite and Martin wasn't with him, his father became concerned and began searching for him. His father ran down the trail for nearly two miles 
until he was sure he couldn't get on any further. After several hours, they saw a help from the National Park Rangers. Now, on the afternoon that Martin disappeared, tourist Harold Key and his family heard an enormous sickening scream and shortly thereafter witnessed a man covered in hair, seemingly hiding and carrying something on his shoulder. Park Rangers and the Federal Bureau of Investigation concluded that there was insufficient evidence to link the sighting to Martin's disappearance, particularly given that the key sighting was approximately five miles away from where Martin disappeared. The sighting occurred a little while after Dennis went missing. Now, the family also said that the person of the woods had something slumped over its shoulder and that had a highly visible red colour matching the shirt of the Ma of Martin the day he went missing. And I wondered if there were any reported accounts of Bigfoots attempting to take children or a female from home and from the sanctuary of their bedroom. And I was a little surprised at my finds. A woman called the cops after a Bigfoot peeped through her window and a lady made a report to the BRFO and an investigator was sent out to interview her at home and this is his record of the conversation. I spoke to the witness at length over the phone. The witness is a delightful lady who was very happy to visit and talk about her encounter. She and two of her friends were staying up in bed late at night around 11pm when they were much younger and they were trying to stay up till midnight. The bed was right up close to the window and the house sits on raised concrete foundation and the bottom of the window was about six feet off the ground. They had the window open, but the screen was closed. Now they were enjoying the breeze and looking to see if anyone else on the small street was awake. There was no street lights in the neighborhood at the time and there were bushes in front of the window, but there were a good sized space between the window and the bushes. They all heard the bushes rustling and did not think much of it but were curious to see what was making the noise. As he turned to look, the witness was face to face with an animal. She estimates she, um, she was between 6 to 12 inches from it. She remembers it vividly. The animal, she described it, had brownish hair. The hair was longer on the shoulders and shorter on the face. She does not distinctly remember a neck, and it was covered with hair, and the hair was matted. The animal did not open its mouth. It had a slight brow ridge, brow ridge, but it was not overly excessive. What is burnt in her mind were the eyes. They were darker in colour and they had a little white around them. Oh. The white part was very bloodshot. <laughs> the witness stated that as a 10 year old, she felt scared of those eyes. But as she has thought about the encounter over the years, she now feels that it was studying us, observing us, and that it was not threatening. And the top of its head was about three inches below the bottom section of the window, which would place it at somewhere between six foot six and seven feet tall. She estimates that while it seemed like an eternity, the duration of time where she was staring at the animal was between about 10 to 15 seconds before she turned and screamed. Her mum came into the room and she remembers smelling an almost skunk-like smell, a very musky smell, but the smell was not overpowering and it was mild in its strength. Now the police were called and the next day they came and did a thorough investigation. No evidence was found, but that's not surprising. It was late summer in Oklahoma and it had not rained in a long time, making impressions virtually impossible. The encounter has had a life-changing effect on her and she knows what she saw was a Sasquatch and she has no doubts about that. She also stated that she never opens her windows at night anymore. Now the house at the time sat on the edge of some woods and the woods were hilly and had several creeks within them. I asked if she heard any sounds such as dogs barking and she replied that she remembers that her neighbour's dog, that her neighbour did not have dogs, so that was not unusual. She tells the story to her children and grandchildren now and they were the ones who encouraged her to submit the report. Bigfoot sighting in Pennsylvania. I live, in, I live in southwest Pennsylvania, about 15 to 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Where I live, there are woods around my house and I live on top of a hill in a small housing plan. I will say the woods are not extremely dense, with one cluster of woods behind my house backing onto a community park with ball fields, etc. But I have had some strange experiences and possibly exciting. It was probably around one to two years ago now. 
and my family and I heard loud bangs in the early hours of the morning against the side of the house. And a few of these bangs actually rattle the house. But they all seem to occur on the left side of the house, up near the roof. We have final siding on that top portion of our home, the bottom being brick. My bedroom is at the front of the house on the side, and on the wall of which is my headboard sits is the wall on which these bangs occur. They all occurred somewhere around three in the morning, and they were so loud it was as if something extremely heavy, like a large brick or a stone or a baseball hit with a bat, was just being thrown with force at the top of our house, up near the eave of the roof. One particular night I heard this and I was lying awake on my phone, as I am now, and something compelled me to get out of bed and look out the window. I looked to the side of my blinds and I saw a dark, large figure in the middle of our street, probably about two to three houses down, and it was illuminated by the street light. I was shocked at what I was seeing, and I didn't want to call out to anyone in case this thing may hear me yell from where I was at the window. I bolted out of my room and down the stairs and I told my mother to come to the former living room, which is below my bedroom. But when I got to the window, the figure was gone. I can say it was very large and it scared me, even being in the safety of my home. To this day, I feel that it was a Sasquatch, but I wish someone else would have seen it to conclude it, or that I would have had my phone in my hand and I'd take, thought to take a photograph. But I threw my phone down in the bed when I got up to look out the window. Young boy views Bigfoot through the window, February of 1979. In Pine Lakes Ranch, approximately five miles north of Cascade, about two miles off Highway 55, and the nearest town to me is Cascade, Idaho. When I was eight years old, I was living in a forested portion of central Idaho. My little brother and I got up on a snowy February morning at dawn to watch cartoons. It was too early and only a test pattern was on the TV. We turned off the TV and my brother went back upstairs to bed and I opted to stay on the couch in my warm blankets and wait until the cartoon started. Now the couch was positioned along an outside wall beneath a row of three inch wide by five inch tall picture windows. I think that might be three feet wide by five feet tall. These windows were approximately seven feet from the ground on the outside. The 19 inch TV was sitting on top of a tall wood storage box next to the wood stove directly across from the couch. I could see the reflection of the window in the darkened TV screen, and I dozed off for a while, and I was awakened by a noise which I thought was the snow sliding off the metal roof. I noticed a shadow shape in the window, and it was reflected nearest to the stairs, and at first I thought it was a snowbank created by the snow falling off the roof. Then I saw the shape move onto the next window, and then it stopped at the window, just past the head of the couch. I listened, and I heard some movement outside, and also sort of grunting noise, and my heart started to race, and I watched the mirror reflection in the TV screen. Curiosity got the better of me, and I sat up on my knees on the couch. I leaned over the armrest, and I looked out of the window, and I will never forget what I saw. There, just a few feet away was a Sasquatch peering in the window. It was scanning the room with obviously curiosity. After a couple of seconds, it sensed my movement and looked directly in my eyes. The face looked like a gorilla, but with longer hair and smarter eyes. It was not like the dark black eyes you see on other forest animals. I was terrified. I dive off the couch and I scurried on my hands and knees towards the bottom of the staircase. I tried to call out for my mum, but my voice didn't work. I was afraid the Bigfoot would hear me. And finally, I gave out a few meagre calls and my mum finally appeared on the balcony above the room. What's the matter, she said. There's a Bigfoot outside, I whispered. At that point, I started to cry and shake. Sensing that something had terrified me, she said, well, get up here then and I was still afraid to move. She said she couldn't see anything outside from up there, so I flew up the stairs using my hands and feet. My mum knew I wasn't joking around, and she wouldn't let my brother and I outside to play in the snow until later in the afternoon. My brother saw the holes in the snow where I thought the animals stood. 
but Snow had partially filled him in by then, and he wouldn't believe my story. Years later, a friend at my mum's who knew about my sighting gave her an old local newspaper with a story in it about multiple Bigfoot sightings that occurred within a 30-mile radius of our home during that 1979 period. And the next account is, to me, very similar to how things happen for the Brits. They see something and they have no name for it. And many years later, they'll be online or they'll be reading a book and they will suddenly see something very similar to what they saw and that gives them the word that they can then use. And this is the memory of Jingle Jack. Growing up, we lived in the suburbs and there was a prowler in our neighbourhood. I was nine years old back then and I was nervous and excited at the same time. We all gave him the nickname Jingle Jack because he always sounded like ringing bells when he ran. The house Jingle Jack broke into the most often contained five females plus one female German shepherd that hated men. There was a mom and her four daughters ranging from ages 8 to 18. Nothing was ever taken but there would be a flower on someone's nightstand or a note left in the kitchen, a handful of hard candies left on the counter and the dog never barked and the doors were all locked in the morning. I lived right across the street from them and my bedroom window was facing the street. I could see everything. My parents had strategically planted a tree about eight feet from my window, providing me with privacy from the street. It was a cool summer night and I had my bedroom window slightly open. I woke up suddenly from a deep sleep to the sound of jangling bells. Ha! I've got him, I thought. I decided not to open the curtain on the side of the window. I feared he would hear me, so I crept up to the middle of the window, grasping each curtain in my hands. I slowly parted the curtains just a little bit so I could look outside and guess who was standing just outside my window looking straight back at me. I stifled a scream and I ran from the room to my parents' room and I crawled up into the bedspread, which they had folded across the large bed. This was not the first time I'd taken refuge in a large chair with the bedspread and I always got out before I got caught. I don't remember what Jingle Jack looked like. Whatever it was, a man or a woman or another kind of being, so I never told anyone about this because I felt so stupid and somehow I managed to suppress the memory and that was probably for the best. But when I was 15 years old, a couple of my friends and I went to see the legend of Bob Boggy Creek and in one scene, a woman is sitting on the couch terrified and she gets up and walks to the window. Now I'm terrified because I know what she's going to do. Do not open those curtains. I thought I even said it under my breath but my friends didn't hear me. The woman opened the curtains and there on the other side was the Boggy Creek monster looking right at her. I screamed so loud that I thought the whole theatre was looking at me. I cowered in my seat as the memories of Jingle Jack came flooding back. I explained it all to my friends on the way home and they understood. To this day, I have not looked out of a curtain when I hear a noise outside outside and now to my native land and a very similar face at a window. The eighth face at the window, Seven Oaks, England. I lived in Seven Oaks in the 70s, known as the Garden of Eden. I lived in the street with a series of houses which was laid out in an oval shape. Now the street itself had about 40 houses or so and then it was just fields to the left and countryside and woodland for a few miles at the back. The countryside was pretty thick in places. There was pine forests and oaks and birches and it was quite diverse. So I guess you could say I was on the outskirts of town. I was about 10 at the time and it was a Sunday night and I was waiting to watch how the West was won. It was pretty cloudy and foggy and still, it was a still night that I can remember. I went to my kitchen to make a cup of tea and in our house we didn't have, at the time, double glazing. It was one sheet glass window pane with metal partitions so when you had to cook or boil a kettle and it was cold the condensation would occur and settle on the glass. I waited in the kitchen for the kettle to boil and out of the corner of my eye a face a bit appeared in the bottom pane. At first I thought it was just my reflection and then I looked again closely. 
This time the face was pressed itself hard up against the window. And it was a sort of a chimp or a human style face. It was youngest, I'd say. I pretended I didn't see it, but I was absolutely terrified. I left the room and I sat down motionless and I couldn't say a word. So at the time I decided to draw it and I did so straight away. As an addition to this, the face resembled that of a chimp with a short snout, black or brown eyes, but with human type hair everywhere. Well, there are other reports of children in the UK seeing faces at their bedroom windows, figures standing in the garden watching their room, footsteps going around the gravel. And in one place in the northeast, one witness described the creature he saw as a young gorilla and it was watching him from the trees. I hope you've enjoyed this. And if you have, please feel free to share it or click like to show support. And I wonder just how many more people of visitors at the window across the world and hopefully we'll find them and if we do i'll bring those reports to you so thank you very much for tuning in um it's been absolutely wonderful the nights are drawing in here now it's getting darker and colder for everyone so wrap up and i'll see you all next time good night <laughs>